So when you took over WCW, the big get for you was Hulk Hogan. That was the, that was the thing that changed it all. But before you got Hulk Hogan, he was in WWF. There was the steroid trials, all these things that went on. You know, he largely wasn't as successful with them as he had been before. What was it about? What was it that made you think that even though he'd maybe not been as successful as he once was, you could take him and put him in a situation that would make it successful for WCW? <sighs> You know, the, the truth is, when I took over WCW, and it didn't happen all at once, it wasn't like somebody came in and said, okay, here's the keys to WCW, make it work. And oh, by the way, you know, here's a billion dollars, go spend all the money you want. That actually didn't happen, even though that's kind of the narrative that's out there. Um, it was a progressive, slow process. And when I took over WCW, when I actually had real control, because even that didn't happen immediately. I was, initially I was in charge of the production side of WCW. I controlled what went on in terms of physically producing the show, but I had no control over the wrestling side of things. I didn't hire wrestlers. I didn't fire wrestlers. It, that, that's not how it started. Eventually, it became that way after, I've had, after I had some success. But when I first took over WCW, to your point, um, they were it was a company that they grossed, you know, all the money that came in the door equal to about $24 million, but they were losing $10 million in the process. It's not good math, right? That, that's what I inherited. And Hulk Hogan became available, and, and that story, you know, it's a long story, and I'll try to keep it short because we, we only have a certain amount of time, but, you know, actually it wasn't bringing Hulk Hogan in as the first thing, the first thing that I did was start producing my shows at Disney MGM Studios. And I did that, one, out of necessity, because we couldn't put 350 butts in seats to, to produce a television show to save our life. We couldn't give the tickets away. Because everybody before me had given tickets away so often that nobody was prepared to pay for them. Plus, the product sucked. It's, you know, I give, it's, I'll make a quick analogy just so you understand the context. It's like going to a bar and sitting down and having a beer and having some good-looking chick come up to you and say, hey, want to have a beer? Go up to the room? Sure. So you have a beer, you go up to the room. Next night you come down, she comes back up again. You want to go up to the room and have a beer? Sure. Let's go have some fun. Third night she comes down. And I say, hey, you ready to have a beer and go up to the room? She says, no, it'll cost you 500 bucks. <laughs> well, we had had a beer and gone up to the room so many different times that when we started to ask people to pay for it, they said, what, are you kidding me? We're not paying for that. We've been getting it for free. <laughs> so I had to change that. And the way I changed that was to change the perception. So instead of, you know, wrestling and... Uh, an empty arena filled with 300 people and half of them were drunk sleeping during the main event, we, we went to the Disney and Judy studio so that it, it looked like a more energetic product. And it looked to advertisers like a more sophisticated product that was advertising friendly. Going back to the question this gentleman asked earlier, Hulk Hogan came shortly after that transition. And it was the same thing, the same thing applied. Even though Hulk Hogan has, was kind of, he had gone through a lot of controversial stuff because of the Zero Road trial and all the negative publicity that was associated with that and WWF at that time, it was a risky move to bring in Hulk Hogan, but it was also a move that I knew the advertisers would start looking at WCW and go, wait a minute, first they went to Disney MGM Studios, that's a big brand, and now they've got Hulk Hogan, that's a big brand, so maybe there's something going on over there. That's why I brought Hulk Hogan in, and that's why he was so important and so pivotal in WCW's success. Not because it brought a bunch of fans to the, to the, the, uh, to the business, because it didn't. He was, his image was hurt. He was struggling. You know, it didn't really work as well as we had hoped it would in terms of fan reaction after the first month or so. It, it became difficult and challenging, but it was also strategically, or tactically, um, it was the right move to make. And around the same sort of time, you guys signed Randy Savage. And he, for a couple of years, had been commentating with WWF. And can I, say, I would say wasted. You know, he wasn't getting in the ring as much. He wanted to get in the ring more. So he almost came to WCW with a point to prove. 
Um, what led to you signing him, and did it live up for you to what you wanted it to be, and what was he like as a personality to work with? Randy was awesome. You know, and I'll answer the first part of the question before I get off into the weeds. Um, you know, Randy was, as you pointed out, Randy, you know, Vince McMahon, I, I don't want to speak for him, but as a, the story was told to me by Randy, um, Vince McMahon didn't see Randy Savage as an in-ring competitor anymore. He thought he was too old, thought the character was tired, and wanted Randy to be a color commentator. Well, Randy was a very, very competitive person in every way you can imagine. And Randy didn't like the idea of being relegated to the announce booth. He wasn't ready to retire. He was very frustrated because he was so passionate about being a performer. And that's what led to Randy contacting me, much you know, opposite of the narrative that's out there. I wasn't knocking on everybody's door trying to steal people from WWE. They came to me, I didn't go to them. And Randy came and he said, look, I'm not ready to, to retire in the ring yet. I wanna be active, do you see a role? Well, Hulk Hogan was, in fact, Hulk Hogan was the person that brought us together, really. Um, and I thought, what the hell? Let's, let's give that a try, but here's the good news. The good news was Randy Savage was sponsored, for the most part, by Slim Jim at the time. And when Randy Savage came over to WCW, his Slim Jim sponsorship came with him. Well, actually, it came to me. Not personally, but it came to WCW. So Randy's contract, I believe at the time, was somewhere between 700,000 a year and a million a year. It was, I think it was 750, if I recall. And the sponsorship that came to WCW exceeded that. So Randy was free. It didn't cost me a dime. <laughs> and it also helped with the perception because now I had a national advertiser that I didn't have before. So I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, I get Randy Savage, it doesn't really cost me anything. I get a national sponsor that makes me not only cover his salary, but I look better. I think I can figure that one out. And you don't have to be that smart, trust me. It's a really easy decision. And when Randy got in, he was, such a, he was a dream to work with. He was intense, he was a little unpredictable. He was an artist. No different than a rock star, no different than an actor, no different than probably a concert violinist at times who become very protective and difficult to work with because they're passionate. Because without the passion, you can't get to that level. And if you have that passion, you're gonna be a pain in the ass. Every once in a while, yeah, things are gonna get tough. But it's just part of the business. But he was passionate.